my happy, happy people out there. I hope you are happy. I hope you are content. I hope you are healthy and out there furiously scrubbing the, the skin off your hands, keeping your fingers out of your, your nose and your eyes, sometimes your mouth. I know it's, it's tough when you're uh, not able to get those, those snacks that you're so used to. But uh, leave the fingers out of the nose. It's a, it's a, it's a bad vector to, to get this. So welcome. Welcome back to the show. And if this is your first time, welcome. Welcome aboard to the Homesteads and Homeschools podcast. I'm your host, the Liberty Hippie, here with you today to bring in episode number 62, which means you can find the show notes for today at homesteadsandhomeschools.com slash 062. My guest today is Miss Jessica Green. She is uh, a prepper, homesteader of sorts. She uh, has a, a show out there called The Jessica Green Show, which you can find on YouTube and any any podcatcher. Um, she'll tell us a little bit more about that at the end of the show, but uh, I had her on to share her adventure getting into things and, and what kind of pushed her into uh, the more self-sufficient lifestyle. And, uh, you know, there's some things in there that will no doubt resonate with, with everyone, but I, I will let her tell tell her story. So let's get down to it. Let's go plant those liberty seeds with Miss Jessica Green. My guest today is Miss Jessica Green. She is the host of a podcast YouTube channel called The Jessica Green Show, and she's going to talk to us a little bit today about uh, her experience um, doing some some homesteading stuff and a little bit of prepping activity, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. What do you, what do you call that, Jessica? Um, I like to actually refer to it as homesteading because it's basically the same kind of activities that would have been going on at that you know during homesteading. So. Yeah. All right. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, just, I can never figure out that uh, that verb. But anyway, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, you're you're uh, down here in, in Georgia with me getting getting hot, getting hot. You uh, how you guys doing? We're really good. We uh, actually started our rain barrel catchment system today because it's been the first day it hasn't been raining in like months. So we had to wait for the rain to stop to put the rain collector up. <laughs> nice, nice. It's uh, it's crazy. You know, it's well, it, it has been raining quite a bit, and you, know, you wish you could just spread it out and get a little bit of that in the uh, summertime when ground turns to sand or concrete. But uh, that would be nice. So, uh, how did you how did you get into uh, kind of homesteading and stuff? Is it something you grew up with as a kid? Did you like grow up in the the country doing this sort of thing, or were you? Um, I I grew up with a single dad, and he was a military a uh, guy who was in the military, and I did learn a, a few things growing up. We would go on these like long duration hikes, and my dad would kind of you know show me things in nature, you know, like dads and kids do, and I learned a lot from him, knowing how to do things like um if I had to purify my own water, you know things like that. And uh, he equipped me with a lot of skills. But when I got out on my own in my early 20s, I was in the middle of a major US city. Uh, and I worked as a waitress. So I didn't keep anything in my own house. I ate at work most of the time. And we ended up having a, a really out of character for our area snowstorm that shut the city <laughs> down for about five days. And yeah, it was it, it was a joke. Um, the way that the city was able to handle this was not very good. They only had four snow plows for the whole city. And um, there were people who were stuck in traffic avenues for like 12 to 24 hours at a time. It got really bad. So I ended up trapped in my house. Um, literally, we couldn't get our cars out of the driveway and there was nothing open anyway. And um, after about day two and a half, the food ran out. And Oof. yeah, so things got real pretty fast. And I vowed, I was like, I'm never, ever going to be in this position again. So it came from experience. I also um, had an aunt who was in Miami during Hurricane Andrew. And she recounted to me many stories of having to, you know, like wash their clothes in a kiddie pool and things like that. So 
yeah, there are a couple of ways I came to this. It wasn't any one event, but if it, if it, if I had to pin down one thing, it was Snowpocalypse 2014. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, we, we were, I was still in Vermont at that time, but I, we were down in 2010, we were in Augusta, uh, Georgia, and it snowed nothing, like two, two inches maybe, and like everything shut down. What people don't realize, um, when you, when you grow up like in snow countries, you, it's so rare down here that, that they're just not equipped for it. There's no salt trucks. There's no, nobody knows how to plow. Nobody knows how to drive in it. It's, you know, it's, it just ices over and, and freezes up and it really does. It, it shuts things down, um, beyond what it, what it does up north when it snows and everybody runs to the store and grabs milk and bread. Um, it really, it shuts things down. It's amazing. It's crazy to see how it happens, but, uh. Yeah, it's curious the milk and bread because it's like, what are you going to do with those two things? <laughs> yeah, well, it's 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 like the toilet paper now, you know. It's yeah. just like it's insane. Yeah. Like, what well, I, I don't I don't I don't understand. But um, all right. So you kind of how how was that then? What did you guys just end up hiking to the store, making do with what you got, eating? We did noodles we, and beans, or we got we didn't have noodles and beans because um I was I had a roommate and then both of our boyfriends also stayed with us and. Between the four of us, we ate the little bit of like leftover pizzas and stuff that we had within a like a day or two. And so we all, we all, you know, bundled up and ended up hiking to the store, which was about three or four miles down the road. And a lot of other people had kind of done the same thing. So we met a lot of our neighbors, people who we had never met before because it was the middle of a major city, but it kind of brought everything down to some simplicity again. In the middle of a major downtown area, we were meeting our neighbors and walking to the market. And it was very, there was a, a very community aspect to it that I actually kind of enjoyed. Yeah. It, it, it is interesting how you're kind of feeling it now a little bit to, to some degree, how things just, when things shut down, when, when everything is quiet and you kind of have to, I don't know, make do with what you got and, and help your neighbors out a little bit. And you have some of that local connection. It, it definitely changes, changes things a bit, but it does. I've seen a lot of the neighbors here in my neighborhood outside kind of just talking to each other and kids are playing. So, you know, for a quote unquote apocalypse, it seems pretty nice. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely something. Are you in town now, sort of? Are you uh, kind of the cusp there or are you out in the country? Or No, we've we've moved out to the country and that, that's been a purposeful journey that, you know, right around that era of 2014-ish, I started getting into wanting to be more prepared just for the, in, ca in case of a snowstorm. And the more I learned about it, the more I'm like, Hey, you know, we're really reliant on systems like trade systems and, and supply chains. And these things are actually pretty fragile. And it started me kind of down a journey where I was like, okay, um, if stuff ever fell down, which historically things do, you can count on it, that things will fall down. Um, how am I going to get through that? And it, made me shift my focus in a, in a large degree toward learning basic skills, things that used to be considered normal for everyone to know that we've kind of given up because we live in a very technologically advanced um, society with or culture with a lot of things that are available at the push of a button, Amazon fresh, you know, and, and all of those things. So it, it unnerved me how disconnected I was from my own survival. Yeah, it's it's crazy to to think about that when you actually you know stop for a minute and think about what what kids learn in school, what's familiar, what's kind of common knowledge, and where that's evolved to in the last hundred years, seventy years, and and how much of that is is basic knowledge that you really ought to know just to keep yourself like alive. Um, and we don't, we don't know that anymore. And it's funny, you know, the, the whole Amazon thing, I, I, we don't have a vacuum anymore. Our vacuum broke. And I went and I ordered one on Amazon because well, where else would you go to get a vacuum? And it's like the date now is, is May delivery date is May. And I'm just, I'm, oh, I'm like, uh, you know, it, this should be here in two days. What happened? You know, like I'm so used to Amazon prime that like that, that is what I expect. And that's, you know, and now I'm, I'm having to deal with something different. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe I go to Walmart now, you know, and I have to buy one at Walmart. That, it's just a weird kind of situation, how reliant we have become on, on technology and, and things we don't really think about until we're confronted with them. Absolutely. So where did you, where did you start kind of gaining knowledge or gleaning information from? Was it, uh, did you use books? Was it people? Was it, uh, 
social media community or what what was it? So I definitely spend a lot of my a lot of my time on the internet and the internet is the first place I went. And ironically, I ended up on the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints website, hmm. which is not a place I w- would have found myself at that time. And they have a policy for their members that their members should have a year's worth of supplies on them at any given time. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Um, Mormon groups have been run out of towns for a hundred years. Yeah. So it makes sense to say, hey, if you lose your income, if you get run out of town, maybe you should have these supplies. And they had some really comprehensive information on like what it takes for a family of four to survive for a year. These are the things you want to have. And I kind of started working toward having those items, realized that my needs were, of course, different than the things on that website, but it gave me a really good primer to realize, you know, in a year, you consume this much olive oil and in a year you consume this much rice and it's not a small amount of rice, you know, Mm -hmm. so or whatever it is that you eat. So yeah, it, 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 I recommend that website a lot and people kind of look at me like, like the (laughs) the Mormons. And I was like, yeah, the Mormons, they really have it figured out. And when you think about it, it makes sense that they would. Yeah. I'll I'll, I'll try to get that link in the show notes. I'll have to check that out. Sounds, uh, sounds interesting. You have to dig around on the website a little bit for it. It's not like prominently displayed on their website, but they do have you know, lists and they're really comprehensive and you do have to click around for them though. It's, it is. It's wild when you start trying to amass stores for yourself um, and, and figure out what you need and you actually start doing the calculations. It's, it's amazing how much we actually consume and go through, you know, how much you actually Absolutely. eat and, and it's, it's, it's wild. All right. So did you, did you, uh, do you guys grow things now? Do you have like a garden now or do you get most of it? Yeah, we're avid gardeners. Um, if you, it's like you're saying about the amount of food you eat. An interesting exercise for people to do is sit down and write down all the plants, the species of plants that you consume. And we're talking all your spices, the different ingredients that come in your pharmaceuticals, your shampoos, your lotions. When you start listing these things out, you realize that you consume hundreds of species of different plants every year. And that's good news because a lot of that stuff, especially if you live in a, a growing friendly environment like where I live, you can you can produce a lot of that stuff yourself. So it's not as though most of our products are made from esoteric ingredients that you could never get a hold of. You actually can create a lot of the, the lotion, shampoos, um, all those sorts of things can come right out of your own yard if you uh, spend the time to gain the knowledge of how to grow the plants. Do you, do you do much foraging and stuff? That's one area. I, I would love, love, love to gain those skills. I haven't had a lot of time to devote to that specifically yet. Um, I just found out, for example, that kudzu is edible, yeah. which is something that is prolific around my area. I mean, you can't step foot outside without a, a kudzu vine wrapping around your leg and trying to grow up you. Yeah. So yeah, I was like, man, this is something to know that there is a vast array of edible plants around me but unfortunately I don't I don't have those skills and you really got to learn them in person because there's a lot of stuff out there that that is or that's that you can use for you know other other purposes um you know but yeah learning them is can be can be difficult but it is when you when you figure out the plants that you do need and you can learn some of the plants in your local environment um and learn that there are multiple uses for them, you know, whether it's a, a green or there's, you know, seeds that you can eat or, you know, make shampoo out of the roots or whatever it is, like all those things are out there. And it's just a little bit of learning and knowledge can, can go a long way with that stuff. And yeah, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think, cause I, I used to do a fair bit of like foraging type stuff, um, mm-hmm. when we were up North and I, some of it I picked up from my mother just little things here and there. And some of it I learned from books since moving down here to, to Georgia. Um, you know, I've learned some things are the same, some things are different, but it is it having someone able to really show you is, is a huge help. Um, I think so if you could yeah. find someone local that, that kind of knows their stuff, it's, it's super duper helpful. Um, I was told it's a lot like chess. You can learn chess from a book if you really put the effort into it, but really you want to play with somebody who knows how to play chess. Yeah, that's a, that's a good analogy. It, it, it is because yeah, you can go out there with your guidebooks, even with your, your pictures on the internet. Um, 
it, it's one of those things, you know, it's like, like mushrooms and, you know, they, a picture isn't necessarily what it will look like on the ground. Um, but it's one of those things where once you learn what it is, uh, that, that knowledge is, you're like, every time you see it, you're like, oh, okay, that's what that is. You know, you start, your brain starts categorizing all these, these things and all these grouping it together and you, you start to build your, build your, I don't know, knowledge base, but. Absolutely. And the more of those things that you can do for yourself, the less dependent on someone else. So it's not as though you should be self-sufficient in everything. It's just, if you are self-sufficient in something, that's one less thing that you rely on somebody else for. Yeah, it isn't. It's useful. You know, it's a nice to have some of those things that, um, yeah, you can share with, with other people, you know, share with somebody mm-hmm. that, that doesn't know that stuff and kind of move it along that way. Yeah. So you guys, you guys do the animal things. You got any, any animals up there? So that's a hope for ours in the next year. We would like to take on chickens first, and then we have a front yard that's about an acre in size. So we want to put a fence around that. And then at that point, consider goats, but it's like, you know, you and I were talking about that fences are either a huge (laughs) pain in the butt or they're a huge chunk out of your wallet, but either way they're huge. Yeah, they, they are. And and goats will, goats will figure out how to get out of Many, many things. <laughs> so. My neighbors have goats and you constantly see them standing on the fence. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> yep. We have, we have, our, our goats are, are fenced in. They got a decent sized pasture and there is one that knows how to get out and she will hop out and she will walk around in the front yard, in the backyard. And it just, you know, thankfully she stays on the property. She doesn't like wander too far off. Um, but man. It's like just, she does what uh, she wants. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> keep her out of the garden, and we'll be all right. But um, uh, yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what are you thinking about for chickens? Are you guys going to try to do chicken eggs, meat chickens? Uh, We're definitely going to want some egg layers. Um, I don't. I I bought a book. I just talked about how useless books are, but I bought a book about raising backyard chickens, and the very first sentence of the book was, "Unless you're prepared to kill a grievously injured chicken, don't get them." <laughs> and that's kind of sat with me. It's like, could I do that? And, um, you know, I, my, my husband is like saying he'll do that part if it needs doing, but I think for our first while, just having some chickens that lay eggs is about my speed. Yeah. 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 I, I, I hear you. In my experience, I've found that, um, birds are much easier to dispatch than fuzzy animals. Um, whether okay. that's ra- rabbits or goats, but uh, something about the, the, the birds just doesn't, uh, I don't know, doesn't phase me near as much. <laughs> they have a, dis- they're like supposed to be descended from dinosaurs. So I think there's like a, like, they're kind of like lizard kind and we're mammal kind. So it's different. Yeah. That's a, I, it's been okay. We've done the meat chickens and, and turkeys and it's been all right, but they are, they're, it, they're, and again, they're useful to have around, you know, um, mm-hmm. they definitely serve multiple purposes. Uh, My dad calls them um, land fruit. <laughs> um, all right. So what, uh, how does the, the sort of prepping side of things work then? Do you, do you just go grocery shopping like normal and you have stores that you cycle through? Is it, uh, how, how does that work? Right. So I practice pantry rotation, which is at first, I think, especially if you've never done anything like prepping or, or, you know, pantry stocking before is you can buy a single can a week for what a dollar, dollar 50, whatever a can costs you and add that to your stores. And at the end of a year, there are 52 weeks in a year. So you would have 52 extra cans of food. And I organize my pantry so that I put the newer cans that I buy in the back, pushing older cans forward. So you're making sure that you're eating the things that will expire first. And then the things that have a little bit longer of a shelf life will go in back. And it's simple, but it takes a little bit of dialing in because I think people, when they start doing this, um, can get a little grand with it at first and maybe buy cans of things that they think they'll want if the, if the, the, the stuff ever hits the fan. Um, but then, you know, you don't need it. You don't go through it. So I really encourage people to buy cans of things that you already eat and things that you will be eating, even though times are good and fat, you know, just keep that pantry and rotation so that you're not looking, you know, say stuff does hit the fan and then you're looking at a five-year-old can of tomatoes <laughs> and you know, that, <laughs> that may get you before the Raiders do. So, and then, um, you know, start, start with a manageable 
idea in your head. Like FEMA recommends having three days worth of things. So that's whenever it's <laughs> talk to people who are just starting out. Yeah, I know FEMA, right? Uh, when they're just starting out, I just say, hey, just start yourself out getting prepared for three days. That way, if a storm happened, hurricane, you got forced uh, to stay in your house for a couple of days, you have at least three days, then build that up. Go for two weeks, go for a month. I don't prep past about three months because I find that I can't go through um, what I have before that, you know, before it starts to expire, if I have more than what would amount to about three months worth of stuff, except for, of course, rice and dry beans, which pretty much have indefinite shelf life. So never hurts to get as much rice and beans as you possibly can. And, you know, that stuff will stay good for years. Do you can the the beans or the the rice at all? Do you like, uh, and I'll vac- like vacuum it or yeah, whatever? Yeah. Okay. So um, some things like beans, for example, um, you can cook them and then can them if you'd like to do that. But dry, they will stay viable as both a food and a seed for, I've heard, up to 25 years. I, I don't know that I'd want to eat 25-year-old beans, but... I know that I have um, germinated beans that were five years old and created a plant that created new beans. Yeah. So that says something for how you might want to choose to store your beans in a dry form. They can be both food producers and food that you eat. Um, as far as like, you know, green beans and stuff like that goes, yeah, you definitely can. Um, you can hot, hot water bath can that stuff, which means you don't need a pressure canner to do it. And that's usually manageable for people who have never done any kind of canning before is a, a hot water bath, hot water bath canning set is like seven or eight bucks at the store and you use boiling water to do it. And you, you can't can everything that way, but it's a really good place for beginners to start. Yeah. The, uh, when, when you have that acidic environment, usually they, uh, that can be pretty pretty easy to do um mm-hmm. we uh I, i've i've tried a, a few other things in like a pressure canner and they always come out pretty good the thing for us is the um i don't know what you want to call it pantry moths uh, is the only thing i know to call them is they just they get in the beans and the, and the rice and sometimes you know it, in the summer we have to have to refrigerate those things or, or put them in the the ah. chest freezer because you know the the bugs get into it um and they'll it'll be unopened and they will still I don't know if the the eggs are in there when we buy it um or if they ah. are in somewhere else and they crawl in but uh yeah it's it's uh it's something that's that's what we deal with but um I have always stored my stuff in my kitchen so I've never um, had any experience with that. Are you um, storing them in like a cellar? No, no, just a just a pantry. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, I'll I'll be on the lookout for that. I want to do some research about that because it's not something I've experienced. But if I do, I want to know how to do deal with it. So you've actually given me a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> so what do you do for for perishables? Your things like your your milk, your eggs, your meat, uh, that sort of stuff. Do you have a, a chest freezer? Is it something that that's what you, uh, you'll go to the store for that? Or do you just kind of? Yeah. You know, so I look for sales. Uh, whenever things are cheap to buy, you buy a little more of that thing. And then they can, you know, people often overlook their freezer as part of their lauder, which means that their ability to store food. So um, I definitely think that a, a deep freeze chest freezer is the way to go. Because you definitely can run something like that off of solar panels if needs be. And it's something you can keep a lot of like fresh things like meat and milk and things like that, which not a lot of people know you can freeze milk, but you can. And um, eggs, uh, that's the the hope for the chickens is that I know that, um, or I don't know this for a fact, but I had heard that eggs that are sold in the U.S. need to be refrigerated because they have a natural coating removed from them. Like I said, I'm new to chickens. I'm I'm a book. I, I have a book. <laughs> uh, so my my hope is that you know having three or four chickens that live in our yard, we'll, we would be able to get fresh eggs from that if needs be, because that's like one of my main food groups. I eat an alarming amount of eggs. So <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need some egg layers. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we go through a ton of eggs. There's there's six of us, and that's like one of the things we just devour. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Great, great, cheap protein. It is. It is. Um, it's not bad when you can get away from feeding the chickens, you know, and letting them kind of feed themselves a little bit. It uh, drops the price of the eggs quite a bit too. So, right on. Um, yeah. 
there's a, um, a friend of mine, she's like, she has a carnivore diet, which means she only basically eats red meat. And this, uh, situation that's going on and it's, you know, cleared the fresh meat off of the shelves. And the only way that she's been able to maintain her diet is that she actually, you know, does the same thing. She, when there's a sale, you get a couple extra of whatever's on sale. And so she's managed to pack her freezer full of meat. So now that this has happened and it's not fresh on the shelves, she's got a freezer full that she can rely on. And it's, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta look for the sales. Um, I go through like a lot of olive oil and the bottle that I get is a $30 bottle, but I only ever buy it when it's half price. So yeah, but, um, because it's such a big bottle, no one buys it. It's a $30 bottle of olive oil. So every (laughs) three or so months they'll knock it down by half. And that's, that's when I get in there. Nice. Yeah. That's, that's the way to go, you know, and, and you can, when you have a little bit of extra stuff, when you are going to the store and and buying things that like you have to have, uh, you know, you don't always have that option of finding what's on sale, but, um, do you guys do much uh, in the way of, of growing things and, and hunting things? or? Right. So um, my I grew up in Michigan. Um, my dad was a hunter. My uncle's a hunter. So I've grown up on venison. Uh, my husband doesn't have a ton of experience with it, but he has been hanging out with my uncle. So I'm hoping that <laughs> uh, they will teach him and bring him out and hunt and stuff like that. But he has been boar hunting. So that I know, I know that if he had to go out there and find us an animal, he, he could do it. Um, but the growing is something that I have really taken the initiative, especially since we've bought our property out here and we have, um, two 20 by 16 beds, um, that are like vegetable beds. And then I've got a ton of like tiered, um, structures on my deck that I grow herbs and stuff like that on. So it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't feed us entirely, but it would be a really good supplement if, if needs be. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, like if you're having a garden that would sustain you, you know, indefinitely, I think it's almost, almost impossible um, for just the way things are right now, but it definitely is, is a nice supplement to have. And it's that fresh food, it's that fresh vegetables, it's those, those fresh vitamins and, and minerals that, aren't always there in the, the canned stuff and the, the stuff you get from the store. So a lot of soils that things are grown in now are actually depleted of minerals. And so some of the produce that you can buy in the grocery store doesn't have necessarily the nutritional content that the same vegetable a hundred years ago would have. And so the, when you grow your own vegetables on your own property, you are in control of what's going on in the growing environment. And we use the back to Eden method, which, um, basically is uh, composting wood chips and that um, replenishes soils as opposed to stripping them off year after year of growing. And yeah, um, responsible stewardship of your land is vitally important to having sustainable gardens. Yes. Yes, it is. (laughs) We're, uh, we're on an old, where we are, it used to be, I don't know, tobacco, soy, and cotton for a long, long time. Oh, that cotton will ruin the soil. Yeah. And then, then he had cows on it afterwards and everything just got compacted down even further. And we're really trying to kind of, you know, put, put some stuff back in the soil and, and work it a bit. And it's, I think it's gotten better over the last few years. We've been here for, for five years, but it definitely was one of those things. It was, it was noticeable. It was noticeable. Um, the, the difference in it and just, it's wild when you, you know, people don't think about it, but when you are, you're dumping all those chemicals on, on all the fertilizers, all the pesticides, all that stuff. It just, it really beats the ground up. It really, really does. Um, Not to mention a lot of that stuff. It doesn't even get into the soil. It flows right down into the water systems. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the, the fertilizer and stuff, it's just, it's um for the, mm-hmm. the plants to absorb. It. It's too, too many nutrients and it just flows off and it's, but Hey, I guess that's how it, how it goes. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I won't do it, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that's the thing. I, I, we don't have to just because that's the way they're doing it. We don't have to. Do you, um, you have any, any favorites that you guys grow or. Well, you know, uh, here in Georgia, because the environment is very, it's 
growing friendly. We have basically like three growing seasons, two cold ones and a really long, warm growing season. And peppers do incredible here. So I have, um, I don't know, probably six or seven species of hot pepper that I are prolific and do really well here. And I've gotten, I've got some Carolina Reaper seeds that I'm going to be trying out this year. I don't eat it, but my, but my idiot friend and husband love to torture themselves this way. So I'm going to grow them some, some for that. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Do you save your seeds? I do. I try to, I always like to see what produce from the grocery store will uh, will grow in the first place because some of them don't sprout at all and then which will be true to type and I find the best being tomatoes um, they're they're really you can guarantee almost that whatever tomato came that seed came from the plant will look the, that uh, excuse me the plant will produce the same kind of tomato but there are a lot of other things like uh, berry you know berries for example if you planted blackberry seeds the plant that would come up, would not produce the same kind of fruit that you bought from the store. So those are not true to type plants and they actually need to be grafted onto roots and things of that nature. So it just depends on the species. And I tend to grow a lot of stuff that I can recycle right back into a plant. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, man, I, we've, I've, I've tried like squash, tomatoes, your peppers, your, your, you know, beans, stuff like that. Those are pretty good and easy. We're, uh, we're trying to, trying to save some from like corn. I got some carrots to go last year, which is pretty cool. And, uh, some of the, some of the brassicas, but uh, again, you know, it's, it is, it's tough. It's, it's tough to do sometimes with some of the, the different, different species there. But, um, we had our first 80 degree day here in March, which was super early and brassicas, they don't tend to do well after 80 degrees. So I'm not holding out a lot of hope for my kale out there, but we're trying. I've had, I've had good luck with, with kale, it'll it'll stay for a while um the the broccoli and cabbage and the cauliflower just doesn't do it and it makes me so sad because it it, it usually i don't know i feel like it, it got hot early this year it did yeah very and early I just was was waiting for some things to come ripe and now it's you know if you go eat broccoli right now and it's it's bitter and nasty yeah. Yeah. My, my, I have like four cabbage plants out there. They're very young. So I just, I know it's not gonna, yeah. uh, they're, they're rabbit food. Yep. But, uh, all right. So, um, I don't know, any, any, any advice for people getting, getting into it? Where, where, where do you start? If you want to start, uh, going to the store or less, if you want to start being a little more ready for, I don't know, events like, like we're going through now where, you know, the grocery store is only letting you get so much food and you're not allowed out and where, where, where do you go? Well, I think the main idea is to keep it manageable because when you start kind of getting into the prepper world, things can get really overwhelming really fast. There are people who are obsessed with it and it's more of a hobby than it is necessarily like a way of life. And these people dump all of their disposable and non-disposable income into prepping and they have some, some wild stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm about practical prepping, which means that you recognize that storms happen, floods happen, forest fires happen, viruses happen, and you might have to stay in your house for a few days or a couple of weeks. That kind of thing is actually pretty frequent. And um, the thing about the cans as I said, you can add a single can to your grocery list a week, which is really, we're talking about a dollar a week. It's not going to create a hardship on your family. It's not, you know, something that most people can find a, an extra dollar. And over a year, you would have 52 extra cans of food, which believe me, if something happened, you were stuck for two weeks, you'd be glad to have those cans. Um, keep it to food that you already eat, as I said. And, um, don't try to like get ideas of grandeur about like, well, I, I, I want to have carrots for the rest of eternity. So I better buy, you know, eight cans of carrots, you know, per trip. No, if you don't eat canned carrots, don't buy them. You're just going to end up wasting them. And then, um, also think about having a, a container that's meant for storing water on hand. You don't have to keep it filled with water constantly. Um, water storage is actually kind of a complicated thing, but a, a foldable camping container that 
you know, holds about five gallons or so just in case you needed to bug out or just in case your water could be compromised by natural disaster. I really recommend they sell on Amazon for like 10 bucks, a five gallon foldable water container. And I just think that like everybody should have one of those. You can keep that folded in a drawer until you need it. But then if you need to have it, you can pull it out, fill it up, and then you have some safe water. Right. How, so yeah, I, I, off of that, uh, your, your water catchment. Um, yeah, I, we're putting that in today. Did you, did you design that? Or was it something that a uh, package that you, you purchased or what, what, what is it? No, I, I actually designed it and I'm really proud of it because I was watching something that I imagined in my mind be, uh, created in reality today. So that was kind of surreal and awesome. But I did a lot of research before I designed it. So it is taking off the designs that, um, you know, I've watched like hours worth of videos on YouTube. I've done a lot of reading on the topic. And water storage is something you don't want to do half-assedly. Sorry, I can't think of a better way to say that. Um, You know, you want to do it the correct way, the safe way. You want to use the right materials. You want to get food grade water barrels. You want to make sure that um, you're not going to create a a deadly situation for yourself because dirty water can kill you. So we're intent is to use that water catchment system for our gardens, but if needs be, and if for whatever reason, the city uh, that we live in, their water becomes contaminated, we would have our own water that I would then take and purify to make it potable again. But, you know, we, we have it set up with, um, you know, filter mediums and things like that, that are a little, a little more than you would get from a package that you would buy off of Amazon or Home Depot. A lot of those are just meant to collect the water that runs off of your roof and then goes down your gutter and collects into a barrel. And most of that's fine for watering your gardens and stuff like that. But if you ended up having to drink it, you wouldn't want something that ran over the tar paper that was on the top of your roof. So um, we designed basically a small version of a roof and gutter system that has a corrugated metal top and the water will run down that into a gutter that goes through several filters and then into these rain barrels. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit more, um, I, I, in my opinion, and I hope, (laughs) I hope it will bear out that it's safer, a little bit safer to drink if, if we ended up needing to drink it. Yeah, that's, that's, uh. Impressive. Always fun to do do projects around, and and when they when they finally get done, it's just a, a big sigh of relief, excitement. But um, so if if uh, people want to come check you out, where do they where do they go to do that? So I have a blog on WordPress. It's called the Libertarian Kitchen Witch, and I kind of post recipes or prepper ideas. I we made clay out of like uh, Georgia clay one time, and I posted about that. So there's just kind of like a potpourri of my uh, homesteading activities there. And then I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's called the Jessica green show and that's a uh, YouTube forward slash C forward slash Jessica green show. And, um, that's also can be found on podcatchers. So if you're like on anchor FM, Spotify, anything like that, you can find me there. And I'm very active on Twitter. You can find me at anarchy toward. And if you have any kind of homesteading or canning type of question, if I can help you, I will. And if not, I'll tell you so, and I'll send you to the right people who can. Right on, right on. I'll put all those links in the, in the show notes. Um, as well. And, uh, if you want to send me a picture of the, your, your water catchment, when it's all done, I will, I will throw that up in there as well. And people can see what you've done. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm actually going to post that on Twitter because I'm really proud of it. So uh, you'll see it for sure. All right. All right. Sounds good. I, I mean, thank you for, for coming on and, uh, encourage people to come go, go check you out and, uh, see what you got, got going on there. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. No problem. Take care. people that was that was jessica i hope you guys enjoyed it go check out her show go go show her a, a little love and uh you know subscribe youtube is is uh tricky so subscribe give her give her some of that some of that love and uh 
give me some of that love. Why don't you uh, share the show around and uh, leave a review on, on iTunes or wherever it is you, you listen to your podcast. And if you haven't, hit the subscribe button. Go do that now. Uh, a couple of things. So uh, during the show, we talked about eggs for a little bit. And uh, I want to share with you guys a little bit of information there that I've, I've done some reading on in the past and I want to get that out there to you guys. Uh, when eggs come out of the chicken, they have a, a natural bloom on them that seals the shell, prevents bacteria and air from penetrating the shell and shortening the, the life of the egg without refrigeration. When you wash an egg, you wash that bloom off. Um, consequently, it needs to be refrigerated. If you leave the bloom on, it doesn't need to be refrigerated. It can sit out on the counter for an extended period of time. The concern with this is that chickens have salmonella in their intestines. It's in their poop. It gets on their butt. They sit on the egg. The egg gets salmonella on its shell on the outside. You take it inside, you get it on your hands, you put it down on the counter. Wherever the egg goes, there's potential for salmonella contamination. You know, something that I, I don't think is necessarily a big deal for, for small scale when you're kind of paying attention to these things. And you know, when you're doing things more at the industrial level, I, I can see where it might be a problem. But so that's how we do things here, right? We wash our eggs, we throw them in the fridge, and we're, we're safe from salmonella on the outside of the egg. In Europe, they leave the bloom on the eggs. They don't wash them. They put them in cartons and they leave them out on the counter. And so if you go to the, the store in somewhere in Europe, that's how you're going to find the eggs is, is room temperature. Now, the problem is chickens can actually get infected with salmonella. They can actually have salmonella in their ovaries, which means that you could potentially have an egg that has salmonella on the inside. Salmonella got in the inside the egg before the, the, the shell even formed. You know, you just got a little, little salmonella time bomb waiting for you. In Europe, they vaccinate all their chickens against salmonella. So that's part of the, the reasoning why they can leave their eggs out on the, the countertop and why we do not leave eggs on the countertop stateside because we don't vaccinate our chickens against salmonella. Now, I did not read this anywhere. Uh, I did not find any anything that specifically said this or not one way or the other. Why we wash our eggs here, yeah, so maybe there might be salmonella on the outside. But since we, there could be salmonella on the inside, I'm thinking that maybe you need to get them in the refrigerator to retard some of that salmonella growth. I didn't see that as reasoning in anything that I read, but uh, in, in my head, that's kind of what might make sense and why why there is some of that difference. So because we have, we can potentially have salmonella in our eggs here in the States, uh, that's one of the reasons that the uh, proper cooking guidelines for your eggs tells you to turn them into rubbery briskets of, of inedible dog food. You know, but uh, it's there and it's uh, not exceedingly common. It's not a big problem when it comes to salmonella. I know lots of people that leave their eggs out on the counter. I know uh, we do from time to time when the fridge gets full. Um, and I don't think I've ever gotten sick from salmonella. Uh, so do what you will. That is the, the main difference uh, there. So yeah, I guess that's pretty much it, guys. Go check out Jessica. Go leave her some love. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Be be responsible. There's uh, governments telling us what to do right and left. Um, be responsible for yourself. Do, do what you need to do to stay healthy and to keep those around you healthy. If you know older folks, um, help them out. You know, do some grocery shopping for them. Take their trash out, whatever you can do for them. Help them out so that they don't uh, they don't run into any any future problems. But uh, I guess that's that's all for today. Come back next week. I will have more, more, and more, more, more homeschool stuff. So let's get out there. Sow those seeds of liberty. We can all reap sheaves of freedom together. I'm